that's really heartwarming. All of the metrics say that people, this will get a lot of clicks, a lot of impressions, a lot of likes, a lot of shares. So this campaign will be a great success. And then guess what? Is your community any better for it? Absolutely not. But some, some white person probably got a really good bonus for it though. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Do You Know Black Creators Kickback. I'm Melissa. And I'm Darnell. And we're the creators and executive producers of Do You Know Black The Game Show and the Do You Know Black Kickback. Today, we're going to be diving into the latest episode of the Do You Know Black Kickback and adding our two cents into the conversation. So let's get right into it. Today's topic is focused on black owned businesses and their responsibility to the community and vice versa. Something that we're well versed in as black entrepreneurs who have a deep investment in other black entrepreneurs. Yeah. So the first question that I just wanted to like talk about right away is the first question that Lamont asked uh, the group, uh, which is do black owned businesses uh, have a responsibility to prioritize uh, black consumers? So I'll let you kick it off and just like start to give your thoughts on that question. Uh, and then we could just have a dialogue from there. Um, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question. I, I think that a lot of black brands already do prioritize inherently other black consumers, just given the nature of most black, well, I wouldn't say most, but I know many black brands have been started off the fact that there was something in the market that did not exist that catered to black consumers, whether it was a hair product or a skin product or whatever the case may be. So they were prioritizing consumers and thinking about producing that product. So I think that it needs to be a priority. No, I feel like you can create a product that addresses a wider need that's not specific to, to black people. So I feel like if you're a, a black owned makeup beauty brand, you shouldn't have to prioritize black women when making that as a black woman, but you should be inclusive of black women in that product. But you don't have to specifically say, I'm only focusing on women of color because then I think you leave women out of that market and you leave money on the table, which ultimately over time hurts your business. So I feel like we should be inclusive and thoughtful of, of, of other women, black women or black people in general, depending on the product, but I don't think that it needs to be prioritized to solely focus on, on black people. I do think that when we think about like the word priority, I think that's the key to this question is what should black owned businesses or business owners, um, prioritize. And I think the first thing that black owned businesses should prioritize is sustaining right? Like that should be the number one thing. Um, there are so many black owned businesses that we see that we want to support that after a year, because there were not the best business practices or because they did things that left money on the table or because they weren't operating efficiently or because they couldn't scale or for whatever reason, their business was not able to sustain. So when you have black owned businesses where it's kind of like the first thing that they're thinking about is like, okay, a specific sector, instead of thinking about how can I get the best business practice possible to make sure that I sustain, I think that that's like the first thing that they should be prioritizing. So sustaining. The second thing that I think should be the priority, priority in life is first you figure out how to survive, then you figure out how to thrive, right? So it's saying, hey, how do I sustain initially? And then after you figure out that, then you, okay, how do I grow, right? I think that when it comes to this situation as black people who have been underserved, we do have to think big picture because when you have black owned businesses that survive, then they thrive long-term, they're able to better serve you, right? They're able to build better businesses, whether it's restaurants, products, they're able to develop more products there. They're able to develop products in a way where they're not going to be out of stock, right? Or you're not going to go into the restaurant and you're there going to be like, oh, we don't have that right anymore. So I think that that's the big, the, the number one priority. Um, so that's my thought initially. Um, I, I think that what you said could be like kind of misconstrued by some people though, right? Because when you kind of say the idea of inclusivity, I think that that would probably be something that could rub a lot of people the wrong way, to be honest with you. I, so I, I get what you're saying. And, and 
let me address that because it's not. I want to give you an opportunity to address that first. (laughs) I think that when you go into business, any smart business person, doesn't matter what color you are, is going to be thinking about how, even if I'm coming out with a hot comb product, and that's something very specific to black people, right? Like, so if that's the case and you're coming out with a hot comb, all right, you know what your market's gonna be, and you know that at the, at, at ultimately you're gonna have a specific reach throughout your, your career. You're, you're not gonna have, oh, like, a huge growth at some point where suddenly like there's going to be a huge spurt in people needing hot combs you know where you're going to be like you have a general market and that's what you're going to be reaching if you're coming out with a product and you sit there and you say going back to the to the beauty product where you're like well we don't have high pigmented colors for people of color right like high pigmented makeup right that that looks better on our skin that does whatever this thing so i'm gonna come out with a line that addresses that you're talking about fenty or something like that Cool. You can come out with a product that has uh, multiple shades of of colors that aren't addressed in the mainstream market, multiple shades of color. But you should already be thinking about, hey, ultimately, if I'm going to reach more people long term, if I'm going to try to grow my audience long term, I should be going into the market with Hey, starting with the white shades all the way to the black shades. It's not, being inclusive doesn't mean that you're being exclusive of, of black people. You're still, you're still going to be offering something that other brands aren't offering. You're still offering multiple shades and deeper shades that aren't on the market already. You're just giving, throwing in some, some other shades on the other end, just to make sure that you're able to sustain that long-term, you already have a wide mainstream market. I feel like there's something we should be thinking about. It doesn't matter if it sounds good or not, but like at the end of the day, that's going to be what keeps your business going is having a wider market that's gonna reach more people than just saying, I'm only gonna focus on this, this spectrum right and then hope that they continue to support me throughout my my career yeah yeah i i mean i i think it's so interesting because when we talk about the idea of like cancel culture i think it's a lot of times people get canceled um or brands get canceled because people are looking at it from the surface right from the surface level um from the headline right so like what you just said for example if I wasn't, if I didn't understand what you were talking about and I just took it at face value, like that's, that's one of those things that could easily get somebody canceled. The real what? talk. No, well, just the idea of like, oh. Of being in, of, of coming out the gate. This is why I said, I, I was very specific in saying that when you're going into creating a brand, you should be thinking about this already so that you're not doing, when we talk about the Shea Moisture example, the problem that I think the problem that occurred was that Shea Moisture came on to the market to address needs that black consumers had at that time that were not being addressed. Then they decided that they were more broad. And I had heard this before. I wasn't a personal consumer of Shea Moisture, but I had heard before that there were other people, like white people, people mixed people who had curly hair, who were also already using Shea Moisture, even though it wasn't designed or built for them. So they already had a market of, of people outside of black consumers. So I think when they try to tap into that and they decided, hey, we're gonna go broad, the the issue that they ran into was, I think, just the marketing with the, the commercial coming out before the other commercial came out and not making commercial with black people in that commercial and having them have their own separate one. I think there was a bunch of mistakes that they made that could have avoided the the backlash. But with that issue, I feel like people were very emotional about it. If Shea Moisture had come out already and had said, hey, we're creating a brand that has a line that caters to 4C hair, a line that caters to 3A hair, a line that caters to 1A hair, pick what works best for you, people would have been fine. But because they came out with, oh, this is what we're targeting, people were very sensitive when they decided to turn around and say like, hey, we have something to offer for other people. I feel like as a black brand, people should be, any brands should be coming out to the market thinking about this ahead of time. Like, hey, in the long term, I'm going to want my reach to be as wide as possible. Not saying that you have to reach everybody, but everybody who, who, who can use your product, you should be thinking about ultimately how you're going to be able to serve them. 
And I think when you have that idea and you go into the market that way, that's gonna avoid those issues coming back where people are suddenly trying to cancel you because they're like, oh, well, you just said that you were doing this for us and now you're trying to, 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 to take care of other people and we don't like that, right? So I disagree, not, not from a macro level, I don't disagree with you, right? But when we start thinking about it from like a granular business practice, I don't think that most, a lot of entrepreneurs don't have the capability to launch that broadly, first off, right? So I'm okay with starting off niche. So in the episode, um, Tamika did talk about like the idea of starting off serving like a specific niche and filling a specific need. I think that strategically speaking, having a, a mindset or a thought process of one, how do I grow? But I also think that's where like communications comes in, marketing comes in, um, your connectivity with your consumers uh, comes in as well. So if you are going to be like expanding your product range, right? Like how do you, one, have your business and, and your counterparts and your stakeholders come together and say, listen, what are the potential ramifications of this uh, among our loyal consumer base? And then secondly, how do we potentially prepare to make this like make this leap right to serve more people and part of that is prepping I, I do think that there's a piece of prepping your loyal consumers that has to happen in advance so i think that with the the shea moisture piece it's not the fact that they started off niche i think that once again with limited resources a lot of people have to start off niche but i think that just springing something that quickly right that that's when you it's very rash um, and blunt and abrupt. And then that's when it kind of catches people off guard. So so that's like the first thing. Um, I do think that it would be okay, depending on what your goals are. And, you know, talking, once again, talking about the episode, Tyler, he spoke about like, what are your initial goals um, that you have for your business? I think that when you start looking at your business, if you, no matter what business you're in, you should always have a growth mindset, right? Because if you don't have a growth mindset and an innovative mindset, at some point there's going to be competition that's gonna come in. And if you're not constantly innovating in any area, whether you're innovating in communication, in, innovating in your product, innovating in your marketing strategy, right? In, innovating in whatever you do, like that's how you get supplanted, right? We see what happened with the Blockbuster and, you know, Netflix, right? And, um, you know, Netflix started off with DVDs and then they were like innovating, innovating, innovating. And probably when they had the DVDs, they were already thinking about this streaming platform. Um, so you think about all these different uh, markets. So I think it's okay to figure out and it's necessary to think about how you can innovate and grow. Um, but that communication piece to your market is very important. But if you were gonna stay within the sector, the other thing I'll say is another way to grow is either one, you can expand your market base. So it's saying, hey, right now I'm serving one specific demographic. How do I serve more demographics? Or the second thing is you can say, how can I develop more products to serve this same market and then figure out how instead of them buying one or two or three products, I can serve the same market, but now they're buying 10 products, right? So those are the two different ways that you can grow um, in my mind, so. And I, again, I said, I think that we're saying the same thing because I did not say, um, I agree that you, you should start a niche, right? Like wherever that market is, like wherever you're trying to address at that moment, that's what you're addressing. I said that you should go in with the mindset, thinking about, like, hey, long term, if I'm going to be sustainable, if I'm coming out with this hot comb now, like at some point, this hot comb is only going to get me so far. So I should be coming in with a thought on what I'm going to be doing after that. Like, what am I going to be bringing into the market after that um, to continue to, to continue bringing in revenue? Because at some point you're going to hit a you're going to hit a rock if you're only creating one thing, one product or you're only targeting one group that that group's not going to necessarily serve you consistently throughout your 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 the life of your business so you need to go in with the mindset that i need to have something else ready to go as soon as this hits if it hits or whatever like what's our next thing and how can i bring in the most amount of people possible within this it's just like when we talk about um 
in college, we used to go to like the Froyo spots, right? A lot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's a very seasonal thing. And it's like, how do you stay, how do you self-sustain like a, a Froyo business in the, in the winter when nobody's eating frozen yogurt? And then these were the same, these Froyo spots started making crepes. Like in the winter time, you'd go there and they'd be making crepes. They'd be offering all these other random things throughout the seasons, the different seasons. Because again, it's when you have something very specific, you need to know how to hit other markets outside of that. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. But I, I agree. I, I just wanted to hedge because I know, you know, I know what you're thinking before you even say it to a degree. No, you don't. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> no, you don't. Yes, I do. Okay. But Next really question. Do. <laughs> so, what was what was uh, on the list? No, no, well, we'll, we'll get to that. But no, no, I, I agree. Um, I, no, I, so I agree with that and figure out how you can diversify. It. I think one of the one of the difficulties that that we as people have as well is like when you we as people or we as black people. I'm sorry, we as black people. You're talking to you know black. So when I say we, I'm talking we. <laughs> so um, so we as black people. I think one of the difficulties that we have when we talk about resources is, is is how do you get like the market data, right? So you develop this product, you want to enter into a market, you want to enter into any kind of industry or sector. So you're, you're a startup, but then it's like, how do you actually, a lot of times we don't have the resources to really understand, um, like you can either say, okay, I'm going to take my resources and develop the product and test it. Or I'm going to take my resources and do research, right? And most of us are going to say, no, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to test launch and then see what happens from there. So this process of one, like testing the market to see, well, is there a market for this? Is it already saturated? Right. Um, and then a lot of times what ends up happening is we jump into a market and then we realize like, oh, wow, like I'm not able to scale it. Like the marketing is not landing the way I expected the marketing to land. And then you have a decision. You can either figure out, okay, how do I shift? to survive because surviving is the number one priority. How do I shift or um, do I just let the business go and call it like an L? So I think that we, I would love to see us as people give more grace to black owned businesses that are trying to figure it out. Not, not just from the stance of like, I mean, we've all, we've all been in the situation of like, we go to a restaurant and we want to support this black restaurant. The food is really good but we're in a rush, right? And, and you know, like there are certain restaurants, like I'm, I can't go there if I'm in a rush because it's like, okay, if I go to another establishment, I'll get served two times as fast. So we've given a lot of black owned businesses grace for some of like the delivery pieces of their business. But I don't think that we've given a lot of black owned businesses grace when it comes to the, the learning curve that they have when it comes to actually building their brand and building their identity. Now I think it I think it ties back to the conversation about the Shea Moisture when products and that it wasn't even a rebrand or anything of that nature. They were just I feel like don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure when they released that commercial, uh, I can't remember what year that was. I think it was 2017. 2017. Something like that. Um, when they released that commercial, I believe that was like their first ad campaign. Like I don't think they had done marketing before that. Mm -hmm. Like like tv marketing so i think that it it came off as like a shock to people that like their first campaign like the first commercial that they had was like this commercial with no black people in it because they didn't know about the other black version doesn't really matter but like i think that kind of seeing that threw people off and i think that part of that spoke to what you said about like giving people grace and trying to present themselves and figure out their identity and i think at that point they had decided that their identity is like really a brand that caters to hair that hasn't been like i think they were trying to get away from the idea that it's only black hair that can benefit from their their products um it's it's, it's hair that it was curly hair or whatever really textured hair or whatever hair that had difficulty being addressed with mainstream products and i think that they were trying to get to that with that story that campaign I, it, it didn't land but again i think if we had given them a little bit of grace in that um we would have seen we would have seen where they were going with it yeah when we think about the initial question that lamont asked which was should black owned businesses prioritize black consumers 
if we think about it strictly as the, the transaction between the business and the consumer, that question doesn't give justice really right to the full context of it and we leave the questions vague when we create them for, for a reason so the, the conversation go wherever it goes but if we start thinking about like the big picture of black people in america as a whole our in my opinion our objective as a whole is figuring out how do we catch up right we we've been hamstrung we've been beaten down we've been held back so how do we figure out, like, if, if we know, we know that we're behind, we know that we're behind by a lot, no fault of our own, but we're behind. So if you're behind in a race, not only do you have to, you don't have to run the same speed as the person that's ahead of you. You have to run exponentially faster than them to catch up to them. And, and then you have to kick it into another gear to pass them and have enough energy to pass them. Right? So if we think about that question, not just in respect to the business itself, but black people as a whole, we should be thinking, what is it going to take for us as black people as a whole to catch up and then surpass? So in my opinion, like, and it goes to something that like Tyler, Tyler mentioned was, you know, when you have an opportunity to get like 400,000, 500,000, if we're thinking about million. it, a million, sorry, my bad. I'm thinking small, right? <laughs> like. Um, but if you, if you can get 400, 400 million, 500 million, 800 million, 1 billion, if you can get to the point where you could do that, if it playing chess, strategically speaking, that's a, it, that's a good strategic move to make. If in your back of your mind, you're always thinking at the end of the day, it's always going to be about black at the end of the day. Right? So, but there are certain sacrifices that have to be made. Um, success doesn't come without sacrifice. So, you know, one of the things that Tyler mentioned, he was like, oh, you know, when you sell for 500 million, the company that you're selling for has to figure out how they, they've already ran their numbers. They've already done the numbers. They've seen what the projections are. They've done the market analysis. They've done these growth trajectory projections, like you name it, they've done all this. And you're giving you're taking that money saying okay like they need to recoup and this is how they're going to recoup and sometimes that's going to be shifting your brand but if you in the back of your mind realize like okay i'll take that deal that might be a small l for us in one area but it's going to lead to a much bigger win in another area this is the strategy that i, I hope that we as black people start to really appreciate a lot more this losing a battle, winning the war mindset, this art of taking one step back, two steps forward, right? So, so this is just a general thought that I had about what he said, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you chime in. I, I think that because I, I agreed with the statement, but it's not even necessarily what I got out of it was was obviously because he was given the Chipotle example, right? Like, yeah. and just to clarify, because he doesn't go into too much depth in this in the the conversation but chipotle had been this new brand that was based in denver only solely based in denver they had a couple of locations they happened to get a board meeting with somebody at mcdonald's one of the investors and they were able to get a secure investment in chipotle very like early on and so you have this huge brand like mcdonald's that's investing in you now and they were able to scale to like 500 restaurants i think it was it was like something crazy like a a, a substantial amount around the country now because you have this investment from mcdonald's McDonald's had made a couple of suggestions like you should offer breakfast, you should have a drive through, you should have, you should change the name to, to be like fresh Mexican grill, something that kind of sounded like Codoba ish, like aligned it with Codoba. And they were just like, ah, thanks, 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 but no thanks. And they didn't, they didn't do it, which is, which is cool because it, they, at least they had that the opportunity to say like, no, like this is our brand. We get our brand and this is going to change our brand. So when they did that, McDonald's was like, all right, well, you know, we don't really necessarily feel like this is gonna grow. So we're going to bow out and they sold them back the shares and then they got their, their brand back. But at the same time, like they were able to invest, they got lucky. 
But at the same time, they were able to get this investment from McDonald's and still kind of maintain the character of their brand. Some people don't have that opportunity to do that, but you also are not gonna have the opportunity to grow to 500 businesses. So you have to decide, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna be a national chain? Do you want to, like, how big do you want your brand to, to, to grow and still be able to maintain the integrity of your brand? Because some things you're not gonna have control over and you're gonna have to say, hey, if I'm gonna take this, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to help expand my business. There's gonna be some things that I'm not gonna have to, that I'm not gonna like, that I'm gonna have to do, like starting a drive-through or changing the name or doing something along those lines. And I think that as black people, we can be kind of emotional about things. Um, not even as entrepreneurs, but as the consumers of these brands that we feel like we're invested in, which is a whole, probably a whole different conversation, but I feel like we, consider ourselves more invested in them than we actually are. Um, going back to the Shea Moisture example, when they were getting roasted on Twitter and all these people are saying, I'm a loyal customer, I'm like this loyal consumer, how could you do this to me? We were, they were like very emotionally invested in this ad, right? And, and saying like that they didn't support it and they weren't going to buy Shea Moisture anymore. But I'm like, at the end of the day, like how invested were you like, were you, we all like to say like, okay, we support black businesses. We go to black business, but I'm not eating at a black business every single night. I'm not eating at the same black business every single night. So while I support them, I'm not exclusively supporting them. So it's the same thing with Shea Moisture. We can't sit there and say like, oh, we, we supported you. I'm a consumer. I'm a loyal consumer, but I'm not an exclusive consumer, especially as a black hair care, a black female. We are the most, um, the most likely to try new brands. We're always looking for new hair care products. We're always looking for new things that work for us. If we find something that works, yes, we'll continue to use it. But like we have, I, I think just with our texture, like there's things that require us to constantly seek out new products. So we can't say we're exclusive to one brand. So we wouldn't have been exclusive to Shea Moisture and to sit there and tell them like, all right, we're gonna cancel you. That's like an emotional statement. And I, I don't agree with us doing that because we're taking other people out of the game based on our emotions about it. So, so I'm gonna have to, I, I'm not even gonna say I disagree, but <laughs> I'm not gonna say I disagree, but I think that th you said a couple of things. I think you made a couple of assumptions that I, I would not, I could not necessarily second, right? I I would think that there are a lot of people who were really hurt by that campaign because they were extremely loyal to that brand. And because that was like a brand that they were in on from like the beginning and they really felt like this personal connection. So so I, I, I would, I think that I can't say that, oh, well, how really invested were you? Like, there's probably a lot of people that are watching this like, yo, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. Right? No, but again, that's the emotion in it. Saying that you were loyal and you were invested in thinking deeply about it. And it, like, I think there's two different things there. Yes, we can be like, oh, we were all about Shea Moisture. But at the end of the day, like if we're only buying it every six months, once a year, we're not using it exclusively. Like the, uh, eventually they're gonna need to grow their brand. How are we supporting them in, in growing their brand? So you can't sit there and be mad if they try to expand the brand. Again, I'm not saying they didn't make a mistake in how they rolled out that campaign. That campaign was problematic. But for us to, I, th I think I've, I've spoken to you about this before, where I feel like I don't even know if this is a black thing or whatever thing, but I think that we're, we can be very protective over certain things. Like I do this too, too, where if I like, like if I hear like a new artist or something like, like, oh, this is dope. I love this song. But then you kind of feel protective over it where it's like, all right, I'll share it with some people, but are you gonna go post on Twitter about it? Like, are you gonna go tell somebody to go buy this person's album? Are you gonna go, like you, at some point it feels less cool for the, the mainstream to know about it. So you kind of like the underground vibe of, of, of specific people, certain people or certain brands or whatever, where like you feel like you're the one in the know, but are you really helping that brand grow? So I feel like we're, we're just kind of overly protective in some, in some 
senses over our our products where we don't want them to grow beyond us because we suddenly feel like we're going to get left in the dust. I don't think it means you're left getting going to get left in the dust. I think it means that the brand's going to be able to grow and be able to produce, develop more products that we'll be able to use. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, one of the hardest things in life to do is compartmentalize, right? And when when there is a brand that so even going back to the episode one of the things that um lamont had asked was um selling out right like is is this action selling out if you go commercial are you selling out we'll talk about that a little bit more but i think that we need to learn how to compartmentalize to go back to like the big picture we can help black owned businesses survive by supporting them by going and and purchasing by recommending by sharing sometimes by sacrificing maybe some maybe another non-black business that's a little bit farther along in its operations we can help a black black owned businesses survive that way but when it comes to thriving and by thriving i mean exponentially like growing a brand this is when we have to like compartmentalize and realize like, okay, this is the role that we played and this is how they're serving us. And then there might be like a little bit of a gap. Oh, you know, let, let's take the city that we live in for, for a minor example. Um, right now, uh, we, we live in a predominantly black city. We bought a house in a predominantly black city. Um, and there is a huge renovation project that's happening um, to restore like and revitalize the shop right. Okay. With that, we are, we're super excited about it because forget all the other development. And there's a bunch of other conversations that we won't even have if people are talking about gentrification or whatever it is, but just the shop right itself. I am, I'm looking forward to having a better shop, right? With a bigger selection. And that's a little bit cleaner and that's a little bit more modern, right? Because now us, a lot of people in City Hall, a lot of other people are going to the next cities over just to go to like another shop, right? Because the one that's in our city is not the best. So they're restoring it. Part of this process is you literally have people that are, um, that are like, well, what's going to happen to our shop, right? Like, where are we going to shop? And it's like, okay, there might be a year period where it's uncomfortable or there's going to be construction. But like, there's this gap where if you can just sustain and trust the process after a year, you are going to have access to a much better shop, right? I think that this is the same way that we have to think about black owned businesses sometimes like there, you have to trust that, listen, there's a period when they're going to have to grow exponentially and, and it might not be the way that it used to be. That relationship might not be the way it used to be, but if you keep supporting and you're part of that journey. You just have to trust that they're going to come back to you. And sometimes like that feeling of abandonment, um, sometimes that feeling of abandonment, um, that feeling of neglect, um, that feeling of not being served that, that we feel when we cancel black businesses or black people or whatever. I think that that could be rooted in some of like the things that happen in our own life. Like we're expecting to be neglected. So when it's one of our own, we take it a certain type of way. But I, I, but you know, I, I want to keep on pushing, and I hope that like through what we do uh, collectively, and from our conversations with friends and networks, or whatever that, like collectively, we can start figuring out like, yo, how can we be strategic so we can get the big wins as a whole? And part of that is sometimes sacrificing that exclusivity that black-owned businesses give you. Um, I think it's interesting that you brought up that example because I, it goes back to my argument about we we can be very critical and can we can be the ones who say like oh this is such a trash store like sh shopping store like shopping center is such a, a trash grocery store i'm going somewhere else you're not loyal to it right like you're not you're not you're not going there all the time but if they try to make it better or they try to expand their base you get upset so it's like, how are they supposed to win at, at the end of the day? Like, do you want them there or do you not want them there? Like if, if you want Shea Moisture to be exclusively, exclusively catered to black women or, what, or whatever, I don't know if they ever were catering to men, but like, if you want them to be exclusively catered to, to black women, are we giving them all of our dollars? 
the maximum amount that they can be making so they can go and innovate and create new products and do whatever to keep themselves going. Are we doing that? I can't say that we are. We can't have it both ways. I think that the question that I have is, where I disagree is that like, I can't, I won't speak for other consumers because I don't know how loyal they were or were not or how important that brand was to them within their like life. So I'm not gonna speak to that. But what I will say is that like, the only way that they would have been been able to grow, if not for trying to extend out to other consumers, or was either we already spoke about like making sure the messaging and prepping, prepping your loyal base for this new launch, or the other one would have been like, okay, well, how do we develop brand extensions? But this process of like extending your brand to different sectors, it's it's a very to different product lines or or, or innovating for different products in general, that's very complicated because then you start saying, okay, now like sometimes there's not like the same efficiencies in terms of your operations. So now it's like, okay, I I'm going to only serve black people and I but I'm still want to grow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out like, how do we get four different more products in our line? How do we start to do different things? So then you start thinking, well, what are the efficiencies with whatever products that they run? But now it's like, okay, well, our entire supply chain might shift. Our operations might shift. We have this, this knowledge gap in terms of like having to know how do we actually develop this new product? All these different things cost a lot of money that, uh, that you're not necessarily bringing in the revenue um, unless everybody is all in on you. But then even then, let's say that everybody was completely loyal. In the race that we're running, it's it's still a race of capitalism. And capitalism is, is not about having just enough. Capitalism is, uh, unfortunately, like it or not, is about having as much as you can possibly have. So if we are comfortable, if we as a people get comfortable and say, well, we're, our businesses should be comfortable, I'm comfortable with what I have, and then everybody else, whether it's like people that are like, hey, I'm gonna put a Chinese food store in the in the middle of the hood, I'm gonna put a liquor store right in the middle of the hood, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a, a beauty store and hair products like right in the middle of the hood, and we know a lot of those are not owned by us. So they're focusing on getting as much as they can from all sectors. We already know that white people are focused on doing the same. So if we don't have that same mindset, then down the road, it's like, we have to accept the fact that like, hey, we would rather just have this like loyalty and have that like, yeah, we're down for the culture thing and forego all the money. But then if we get, if we get lapped when it comes to wealth, then we can't complain about that either because that was the choice that we made. We can't, and the unfortunate truth is you can't necessarily, there's a quote that I love, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at once. And that's kind of the decision that we have to make. For me, I'm about like, how do we as a people win the war? Um, so so that, that side of it, you know, I, I would agree with you in terms of like the necessity for a brand to, to extend that way.